Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for waiting for that short one minute delay. Um, I'm excited to uh, continue our grow series. Um, right now, uh, Will, I didn't tell you this, but we're doing a themed series around startup education. And it's kind of in the, the middle stages after getting like launched and set up in a Delaware entity incorporated and all that stuff, actually getting meaningful traction, whether you know, every startup's different. So sometimes that means a friends and family around, sometimes it means market validation or building, getting MVP and market, whatever it is, we're trying to lump everything together with some of our favorite partners to give insights on the various perspectives of growing a startup. And today's topic is crowdfunding. We get so many questions about crowdfunding and they all come from like this half understood angle of like, well, I think I can take money from anybody, right? Like it's like Kickstarter, but for equity or like I can go and get my uncle to give money to my, my unaccredited uncle through crowdfunding. It's all like, ah, it's a mess. Like there's a tangled weave of information out there about crowdfunding, how to use it successfully, when it is a good fit for your company, what kind of company it's a good fit for. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we've got two people, uh, Will from Incolo, which is a company that actually specializes in helping startups with their crowdfunding rounds and making them successful. So it's not a platform like WeFunder or Seed Invest or Start Engine or Seed Invest or whatever one's acquiring the other one these days. It's actually like a service, you know, more focused on the success of the, the campaigns. And then we've got Pete from uh, Fourscore Law. You might have seen some programming we've done before. Uh, Fourscore is one of our launch uh, Gus launch legal partners. So if you're a Gus launch customer, uh, they're actually available in the network if you want if you need a good law firm to connect with. Um, otherwise, they're just a great startup focused law firm, I believe, out of North Carolina, right? Yes, sir. Um, so I'm going to kick it over to them uh, to do some intros. Legal disclaimer: I'm not a lawyer. I don't believe Will's a lawyer either. Pete is a lawyer, but he's not your lawyer uh, yet. <laughs> so nothing that we say here is considered legal legal advice, accountant advice, tax advice. You know, we have partners up and down the, the gamut to go and pursue those. If you have specific questions at your company, this is for educational, informational purposes only, like all the programming that we do. It's your company. You make your own decisions and use our education to level up and then consult the experts to actually uh, make it real. Uh, yes, we are recording this. We actively encourage Q&A. We have like a light presentation, but most of this is going to be conversational, pulling questions from the audience, questions that we have ourselves. I'm not a crowdfunding expert. I know kind of like who to recommend and like some various like stipulations and warning people about cool down periods and whatnot, but we've got the experts here to really dig dig into these kind of things. We will share a recording of this when we're done, like we always do, but please use the Q&A and the chat functionality. Feel free to throw your location and your startup name in the chat, but don't pitch us. None of Nobody's going to invest in a startup through this webinar. It's all about learning and focusing us on crowdfunding. And so without further ado, I will hand it over to Pete um, and Will to give their interest. Pete, you want to kick us off? Sure thing. Hey, everybody, I'm Pete Singh uh, with Fourscore Business Law. Uh, as Ryan said, we're based in North Carolina, but we also have a, a West Coast presence as well, uh, office out there. Um, so we do startup counseling uh, as well as kind of every stage along the way through exit. Um, our wheelhouse is sort of venture and M&A work, um, but I've kind of carved out a little niche with uh, crowdfunding campaigns as well. Um, we do a lot of work with Will and his companies, so I, that's kind of why I invited him to <laughs> join in on this chat. Um, but yeah, we're we're kind of here to help. We we try to approach legal work as a resource instead of a drain on resources. Um, so a lot of that comes down to things like pricing up front and kind of trying to educate our clients, um, sort of a planned obsolescence <laughs> of sorts. Um, but really to empower you all to, to do what you do and know the deal, uh, understand the ins and outs. Um, so that's, that's kind of our ethos. Uh, we have a few slogans, ideas deserve opportunity is one of them. Um, and we try to support what we call opportunity events, which are kind of pivotal stages in a company's growth, uh, where you're raising capital, for instance, uh, or looking to, to pivot and exit. Um, so yeah, we're, we're kind of, uh, folk that pride ourselves in, in being trusted counsel in those spaces, um, sounding boards for any concerns you might have. Um, and I will include kind of a, a link to schedule consultations or do, do whatever you want to do to connect after here. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it to Will to introduce himself. Thanks Pete. It's fun. Thanks Ryan. It's good to be here today. And I was going to kick off and say, hey, if anybody wants to throw in the chat window what type of company they have, we can like pull up examples and show stuff to you if that's beneficial. But I see people are already doing that. So awesome for being on top of it. 
And likewise, too, uh, Will McGuire here, if, uh, if anything we say becomes like boring during this webinar, please let us know in the chat because that's the last thing we want to do. We want to make this super valuable and interesting to all of y'all. But uh, there's my uh, information for myself. Um, I started in Colo back in 2019, which is, like Ryan said, a company that helps founders raise capital from the crowd because founders we talked to didn't need another platform is what they told us. They need somebody to find a way to not only make their round successful, but how they mobilize those investors for growth. And so during this uh, discussion that we have here with Ryan and Pete, we're hoping that we can show you how like the fundraising journey is part of it, like closing the round successfully is great, but being able to land multi-million dollar orders from your crowd, even more awesome because you don't have to pay that back. So we'll dive into some of that. And if you guys have questions, yeah, drop them into the right. Um, I started out in investment crowdfunding with my wife uh, back in 2016 as investors, because we didn't know we could do it. First company I invested in failed. I learned a lot from that and then became obsessed around how to make companies successful, but also how to help them grow. So that's kind of background on me. Um, first investment was 2016, second one, 2017. And since then I've invested in 90 plus companies, but my primary focus is centered around helping founders grow and scale their companies through the crowd. And then I have some just personal individual stuff that I do on the side. So Ryan, Pete, uh, where do you want us to go next? I mean, did, should we show them like where investment crowdfunding came from or? Yeah, let's give a, a little bit of background and, you know, slice the clarity between regulation crowdfunding is not Kickstarter, is not Indiegogo. Sure. So it's got a bit of a shorter history. Um, and if you want to share your screen and just walk us through a little bit of that, uh, sure you can do that until people say you're boring. And then Sounds we'll do right. something else. <laughs> we can definitely do that. So uh, before I share my screen, I mean, uh, just super high level. I mean, they're, the advent of crowdfunding came about like with the GoFundMe's of the world, which more like donation charity-based platforms and Kickstarter Indiegogo, where, you know, put in a little bit of dollars and you might get your product at a discount ahead of time. And then investment crowdfunding, all it is, is it's saying, instead of just the same parties, or we have to raise capital from the same parties we've always raised capital from, guess what? Now we can raise from them and everybody else who wants to participate in our rounds. And instead of having to go into back rooms and like find these people privately and be introduced, we can simply use like TikTok or Facebook or personal, like we can just do it at rapid pace in a public domain, uh, which I think is more natural to the sales journey for a founder. So that's kind of like an overview of the three different types of crowdfunding, as well as like comparison against traditional capital, normally how I describe it. Yeah, while you're pulling up, it's probably worth saying, because we do have an international audience, regulation crowdfunding is part of the US Jobs Act. Um, I believe Title III was the the changes in, what, 2017? Uh, yeah, a bunch of different years. Like 2015 yeah. was Reg A+, and then 2016 yeah. was Reg CF. And, yeah. Been in this industry too long. Yeah. That's right. Um, uh, that's my kids trying to attack us. Okay, so, like, <laughs> this whole thing of investment crowdfunding, I think, really centers around, at least the way I see it philosophically, is everything that we do as a society is philosophical, is really who should own the future? Should it just be the same parties that be, or should basically anybody in our community uh, be able to own that future? And the, the cool thing investment crowdfunding does is it allows founders and their teams to basically control who is going to share in our success as a company if we're successful, who will share in the losses as a company if we like fail as a company too. So any founder that's ever gone into investment crowdfunding raise, this like common philosophical question I find is common between every founder ever trying to decide whether or not they're going to pursue one. But kind of the way it started was back in the 1930s, you know, stock market collapsed and we had a run on the banks. And uh, basically the Security and Exchange Commission, uh, Congress said, well, we need to protect people. Which... I think actually made a lot of sense back in the 1930s. We need to protect people. We didn't have social media. Ours you know, weren't around that long. We hadn't even hit the civil rights movement yet. It was just, we need to find a way to protect people. Well, how do we do that? Well, the easy way, 
let's make sure that people are investing in these highly risky startups and stuff in their backyard, uh, have a lot of money. The problem I think we face as society is that over 86 years, nobody ever challenged that. And so then you saw these massive leaps and bounds and wealth gap that happened when the technology revolution kicked off kind of the eighties, because the only people that could participate were based on that same type of wealth status. So some people in 2012 um, went to Congress and said, hey, why is it legal for me to go dump my entire life savings in the you know, corner store lottery ticket? Why can I go to Vegas and put it all on black, but God forbid I put $100 into a, a coffee shop in my backyard? Or a company building the next innovation in medical tech that can save lives, or you know, basically any industry imaginable. And the regulator said, well, that doesn't really make a lot of sense, does it? So we came up with these various rules, one of them being called regulation crowdfunding, which in 2016 was passed, uh, that allowed founders to basically raise a million seventy thousand dollars per year from anybody they wanted to. What's been a kind of cool since then is in 2021, they actually raised that cap to 5 million. And now you can test the offering ahead of launching it to see if you're going to be successful or not. Brian, Pete, anything you guys would add to that? Let me think. Um, we do have a, a relevant question right here sure. um, from Al Wagner is, uh, do you believe there's a larger market for crowdfunding investors beyond the financial review cap, which we'll probably have to get into a little bit. More details there, uh -huh. meaning doing a two-year audit to raise the ceiling to $5 million. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like uh, one of the most famous examples I have of that is Mercury Bank. So, I mean, there is an exemption right now just, to, you know, aside from Reg CF, there is one called Reg A+. That allows you raise up to $75 million from anybody. But it, it takes a, a long process, an expensive process to get it launched legally just because of all this, you know, SEC regulations around it. But from a reg CF, hey, I can go launch an offering tomorrow with a couple of simple pieces of information, governance stocks, you know, financial review. Yeah, there's definitely, a, I think, a bigger market for it. And several people have been trying to push that cap well above like 20 million. Um, Mercury Bank, for example, how many of you guys are familiar with Mercury? Just show of hands real quick. I guess they, <laughs> they can't, can't raise their hand. They, they can at least chat in the window. Um, let me pull this one up because I think it's good context for founders. Um, oh, there we go. We got the reactions. Sweet, sweet. <laughs> Probably laughing at me for saying raise <laughs> your hands. <laughs> Look at that. At least 10 people are familiar with Mercury. That's right. Okay, right, so Mercury became really famous after SVB collapsed. But uh, before that, they ran this little uh, thing called a Test the Waters campaign where they said, hey, look, all of our bigger VC players have you know, invested money in us including founders from like Figma, Notion, et cetera. And uh, we'd like to see if the crowd would be interested in participating because their theory was kind of, you know, if, you know, we serve startup founders, that's our customer base. So we think we'll grow quicker if we allow them to invest. So they turned around and just, you know, the CEO launched a single email. Uh, 10 hours later, they had a uh, $17 million of interest. So to answer your question, it's way more than five. <laughs> and then they uh, took, you know, some money in a reg CF capacity. And I think they took some additional capital out of that 17 million from anybody that was accredited. They could channel it to this other exemption uh, that allowed them to raise even more capital. But yeah, that's probably one of the most famous examples of the round being oversubscribed past the five. That yeah, answer uh, the question? Uh, I believe so. I, I marked it for Al Wagner who asked it, but uh, Al, please ask a follow-up or anything like that if you needed more clarity. Um, going through the history that I do, I do kind of want to kind of shed the light on what I think the SEC is doing and has been doing and will continue to uh, do with this because, Will, I kind of agree with your assessment that in the 30s, protecting people from, you know, securities fraud was a really good thing because, you know, you yeah. there was no means to do diligence on these companies you know, people would, you know, come and sell snake oil and steal somebody's livelihood, you know, more have them default on their mortgage and things like that with the promises of being rich the next day. So they put in all these controls. What the SEC has been doing probably over the last seven to eight years is 
slowly changing things to ensure that we don't kind of like throw the baby out with the bathwater in terms of the protection. So like Reg A came out, which was like, hey, unaccredited people can get in around, but the company has to go through onerous disclosure requirements and auditing in order for it to happen so much so that no startup, a true startup would consider it, you know, a year one, year two startup, the amount of disclosure and auditing you'd have to do would be so expensive. You, you couldn't raise enough money to pay for it, you know, the legal work and the accountants to do it. So not a lot of companies did that. Bigger, more established companies with you know, significant revenue lines and things like that were able to tap into some of the reggae. And there's still reggae going on these days. Um, you know, I think platforms like Seed Invest uh, did a lot of reggae deals, you know, upper market, like, you know, that security robot that I think everybody's seen at some point. I know they did a several reggae rounds. Everybody said that the initial like launch of reg, reg CF was basically toothless because you couldn't raise all that much. Like it, there was a lot of caps. There was a lot of stipulations around it. You know, there wasn't a lot of good means to like, even if you were successful to like continue and carry that success into a future round or anything like that. But just as of, you know, the last couple of years, they finally loosened up a little bit. The SEC's biggest fear during all of this was something like what we saw with the ICO craze in 2017. Yeah unregulated, unmitigated, no registration, ability to raise money from anybody results in tons of rampant fraud. Like, and it did, you know, and I mean, honestly, some of that is still going on right now. And the SEC is really going after people this year who are trying to use cryptocurrencies as a means to raise funds and how he tests and all that uh, business. But now I think we're kind of at a moment and we've seen enough how high profile examples where Reg CF is not the way to fleece your uncle out of 15 grand to get your seed round, your, your pre-seed round done. Uh, nor is it, you know, the path to, uh, you know, like a massive preferred round for like a unicorn venture scale, but it sits in this really interesting, well, it totally can be with Mercury with some examples, but it definitely sits in this interesting, if your customers are advocates and can be investors and you have the right kind of company, I think you can use it um, for very successful uh, means. And I think Will will have far more examples of how to do this and what it takes to actually pull that off because it is not like Kickstarter, where you can pop up a page and be like, hey, free money from strangers. Like, let me go run my company. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not built in. They will come. I, I often tell founders it can be harder than a traditional raise, but they might get more sales momentum from it. So, yeah, yeah, you're doing a lot more legwork for much smaller checks. You know, it's one thing to do the, the you know, song and dance number for a $25,000 check at a time. It's, it's a whole other thing if those are, you know, a hundred, a thousand, something like that. Yeah. Um, awesome. Did you have anything else you wanted to share, Will, slide-wise? Uh, I think just, you know, quick on, like, traction stats that have happened. Uh, you know, it is a pretty, you know, it's it's a small industry, but it's grown really rapidly. So, I mean, this is just as of the end of 2022. You know, there's been now, since there's been seven years as of May this year, over uh, 4,000 companies have been funded. But just the amount of capital that's grown organically and the valuations that are even with valuations going down now that uh, companies have doing investment crowdfunding raises has risen tremendously. Uh, the state we operate, there was a uh, 11.7 million raised last year, which, you know, small dollars, but that was 146% growth over the year prior. And we're seeing that every single year. So, I mean, we're even projecting over 50 million this year just for like North Carolina alone. But we're seeing that across the board. And I think what's cool about that is it's because founders are realizing that they can access capital, big small checks and small checks into the same round if they're willing to go after it. So, I mean, we've seen rounds where, uh, you know, where $250,000 check is side by side with $100 checks on exactly the same terms. You know, Pete's worked on some of those rounds. <laughs> I've, I've seen, some seen it as a like a forcing mechanism for, you know, if you've ever pitched professional angels or investment organizations, uh, those kind of investors are not in a hurry to write a check. Usually they like to do diligence. They like to take their time. You know, a lot of time you don't have the time that they want to take with the sort of deals. And so I've seen some companies actually use a CF round to pr provide traction and validation and to blow to to increase the round of accredited later on where it's like, hey, we've proven, you know, we've convinced hundreds of people to take a bet on this. It kind of de-risks it through a fundraising mechanism that just previously wasn't available. Yeah. Yeah. We saw that with a, a company called uh, basically offline in our backyard. 
and all the investors coming in there, big checks, small checks, said, this is the most strategic way to grow and uh, have even more interest. This happens every single round. Once people are on there, like to your point, Ryan, like other investors want to come in because they want to participate in a moving train. Actually, everything. We actually had one of our launch companies, I'll throw, he did a case study for us. I'll throw it in the chat because he wrote a blog for us. They did the kind of the round hop where it's like, raise a little bit from accredited to like get enough runway to actually have the money to run a successful campaign, you know, in terms of like, there's, there's advertising behind it. There's, you know, content, you have to do more than just open up the campaign and pass the requirements, but then they were able to, to roll that into, you know, further on um, private financing. And to that point, Will, uh, cause a question that comes up frequently is, can I, you know, seeing that this opportunity is out there, how do I know if it's actually like for my company and how do, do I, can I just go and do this on my own? Do I need a lawyer? You know, what, what do the first steps look like? Both kind of, I guess, evaluating yourself and your company, if you can take advantage of it. And then how do you get started? Yeah, great question. You, you can technically do these without a lawyer, but I can never advise a founder to do it without a lawyer. Because <laughs> you want the part, you want to do it right. I mean, if you're going to take capital from people, like your life is going to get harder in some ways even if you've got, you know, growth and you're smooth sailing, I mean, you've got responsibility for taking care of those dollars. And so making sure that things are, you know, I's are dotted, T's are crossed, like Pete and crew do, that's invaluable to founders because sometimes it's the first time ever going through a fundraising round. Sometimes it's the first time ever forming a type of company, you know, whether C-Corp or LLC and just trying to get through the process of figuring out which one's going to be most strategic now and later. So even some of like fundamental questions can get, you know, hammered out if you go ahead and pull in both, you know, tax and legal counsel early on, and you'll avoid making a lot of like super, super costly mistakes. And the other cool part about that too, is I think a lot of founders, including myself, like when I first started, I remember this, I was so scared to spend, you know, money on attorneys, not because I didn't trust attorneys. I like attorneys. I like what they do for companies. I like Pete. I like what his firm does for companies. It was that I didn't see the value in having attorneys. And now after working with tons of attorneys, I found that having that involved early in the process, they'll tell you like what you have to do now, that you have to spend dollars on as a founder versus, man, there's this list of stuff you're gonna have to do, but you can wait till after your rounds close or wait till after like this future event. You don't have to spend it now, but at least you got a roadmap for it. And that can be, you know, valuable because as you're a founder, you just got capital. Let's say you're round successful, you close and you like want to grow. Well, now I've got to go back and take care of this laundry list of stuff that I didn't know how to do because I didn't engage attorney at first, but now I found out I have to do it. What a horrible impediment to grow. <laughs> you know, rather just take care of it up front. You are, uh, so you're preaching to the choir here. Well, we haven't even got to catch up on all of what Gus does, but we have a product called Gus Launch, which is basically, we call it company as a service. So it does yeah. Delaware C Corp formation, stock grants. It does advisor agreements, contract agreements, safes, convertible notes, full cap table and whatnot. And we work with law firms like Fourscore to say like, hey, you can self-educate to a certain degree. 80% of the stuff that you need to know, like get your roadmap set up so that you're yeah. aware, like, no, I don't need to do securities filing compliance right now. I don't have to go pay a lawyer $800 an hour to talk about, am I filing form D or reg whatever or whatnot? But I know I'm going to have to do it eventually if I do raise funds. I can safely defer that. I can risk mitigate that. The things that I do need is like, I need a business entity to protect my liability. I should not go scream from the rooftops that I'm raising money. You know, if I haven't gone through some of these things, you know, there are legitimate company ending mistakes that you can make there, but bring in those experts and those counsel to provide what I would say is actually strategically useful advice. Some of it's boilerplate. You know, if you raise funds with a safe, like the lawyer is not going to invent the safe. They will probably download it from the internet and they'll tell you to do the right board approvals and they'll yep. give you strategic advice on what to set the terms at, how to communicate with investors, things like that. That stuff's invaluable to company success. But it's really that that paying a lawyer to educate you on all the stuff that is kind of uh, standard for the industry is those are the funds that I like. I think it's it's worth being like, I'm terrified of getting those things. It's like, I don't want a very expensive education. What I really want is good strategic advice that's actually trying to make my company successful. Look at that. You got a love symbol, man. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't for me. But <laughs> I also love it. Uh, and I'll, I'll just chime in real quick since we're touching on the legal pieces. Uh, I do find our, our biggest value add <clears throat> 
in these campaigns um, is often uh, the soft touches, uh, like helping you just wrap your head around what all is involved in the process um, and how to approach the requirements. So risks and disclosures and all the actual regulatory form C stuff that you'll have to work through. Um, a lot of that looks back historically. It may involve some cleanup work by council um, before you're ready to present it to the world and, and try to uh, raise some funds. Um, but really, I think where we uh, can add value and differentiate you from someone that's unrepresented um, is to have a pulse on uh, some of the things that, that Will advises on, like what to do next. Uh, so beyond the financing, what are your obligations to your investors? Um, and even as you go, uh, getting ready for the launch and afterwards, what are your limitations in terms of what, what you're putting out there, what you're saying, how you're advertising? Um, all of these things are ways to get, either get into trouble or on the flip side, um, actually uh, get in good graces and, and kind of build some traction and um, really pivot toward a successful raise like we're talking about. Um, so, Will, I don't know if you wanted to kind of dig into some of the tricks of the trade. Yeah, let, let's absolutely do that. I think that's what everybody's here for. And <laughs> that was well summarized there, too, Pete and Ryan. Um, well, let me, if I can, I'll just use a few slides here. We'll go through a few examples. Again, like if anybody has a particular type of industry they want us to pull up a campaign for or share, we can do that. But I will tell founders, like as much noise as there is out there saying this only works for breweries, restaurants, or it's really good for B2C. Yeah, it is really good for B2C. It also works phenomenal for B2B. I mean, one of our most successful ever subscribed rounds in our state was for a nanotech company that invented this thing called a boron nitride nanotube that nobody had ever heard of. But guess what? All the engineers that work at all those companies they want interest to, they all knew what it was. <laughs> and therefore that company took off. So it, it, it literally worked for uh, dirt to tower uh, nanotech to aerospace. Yeah, you got some great examples in the chat. And we also had a Q&A question about specifically space tech. And maybe I think we could broaden that to, you know, non-CPG, you know, consumer, yeah. you know, we're not selling just skateboards or toothbrush subscriptions or something like that. But it sounds like you've seen evidence that more complicated, more domain intensive industries can successfully run these campaigns. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I might cherry pick some that are more like a combination parallel rounds, like where you can raise from the crowd plus others because sometimes founders don't know they can do that and sometimes that's the most strategic way to grow is you can actually do more than just one type of round at a time add a little bit of complexity to it but multiple founders have done that too and it can be the best way to get all capital in um so as we're headed into that i mean just one more thing to leave people with the the other thing that i love about investment crowdfunding that's always attracted me to it because i've got two daughters and a son is that uh, women and minorities are kicking ass with Reg CF. They're actually performing better than people that look like me. And that stats is coming out of seven years of data. And I think what's really cool about it is there's all this chatter out there about, well, how do we make sure there's enough funding? There's not enough funding going to uh, minorities, not enough funding going to women, not enough funding going to you know, people who are black or Asian, whatever diversity stat we throw out there, or the rural versus city. Guess what? Investment crowdfunding, we have data, it shows it. Everybody's pretty much on a level playing field, which is really cool. So we don't have to guess where funding can come from, it can just be successful. So like literally just a, a tactic gets started. This is where investment crowdfunding is no different than private funding. A lot of founders will benefit from, from making a list. So let's say, you know, insert your company tight into this list that I've got in front of you. Couple questions. Who do you want to invest? What type of capital can they pull? But more importantly, why do you want them to invest? So this is something we actively go through with founders that ask us to help advise them on how to find investor dollars. And we all it's always a combination between, well, who's going to help you drive sales versus who's going to help pull the dollars in? And what happens in that is, you know, you might have a friend. Uh, that you just want to allow to come in 
because they're a friend. That was one of the ways the whole industry got started is it makes no sense that I can't let my friends just because they don't have a wealth status to invest in my success because I'm leaving them behind. I want them to invest, but guess what? They probably also have a huge network. Every single person, I was just reminded about this the other day, it doesn't matter who a person is or how many social followers they have or who they chat with, every single individual on the human planet has influence. So who do you want with influence into your round and why? The second thing may be, well, who can write a bigger check? Because we know from past history, especially if you're trying to raise a big round, you want your big check writers to the table. You want it to be attractive to them. That doesn't mean they're a accredited group. It could be. But it could just be somebody who's invested before or somebody who has a lot of money who is friendly to you and understands that they're in it for the long haul, but they want to commit that capital to the line. And it, it, you know, they can do that without being a, you know, them considering a huge risk if they lose it all because your company fails. So you kind of want those first check writers and the ones that are uh, big to come to the table first. And then you also want the list of who else in my network has influence that can drive everybody else into the campaign. So after you built a list, the next thing that normally happens is you go have one-on-ones with a simple little landing page, a couple of things about your company, uh, why it's compelling to investors. And you find out where they poke holes in it. Where do they not understand what you're talking about? What do they find attractive that you haven't mentioned? What have you said that completely confuses them that you think is like the most important thing in the whole universe, but you can leave it off the entire page for the entire campaign and nobody will care? That's what we're trying to like demystify about investment crowdfunding. You could equally call this, I'm going after angel or VC capital, and it would be the same process out of the gate, except for how do I mobilize people with influence in their bigger, larger network as part of my investor raise? So that's that's trick one. Pete, any Pete, anything you'd add to that? I mean, what have you seen out there too with rounds that you've supported? I think that covered it pretty well. Um, I I do want to emphasize the the parallel structure um, seems to work really uh, really well in terms of bringing big checks and small checks in simultaneously. Um, we can kind of get into the boring weeds about how that works from a regulatory standpoint uh, with Reg D, 506C, and, and Reg CF. But um, the the real benefit, I think, and this might also touch on some other points of Will's, um, is that the, the regulations have advanced and progressed and been amended since they came out. So one really big pain point early on was that every crowd investor was listed on your cap table and that made it a nightmare for the next round and any future investments. But, um, since that starting point, uh, you can, you are now able to use uh, special purpose vehicles or SPVs for a crowd round. So it's just one line on your cap chart. Um, and that really takes away a lot of the heartburn and pain from going through the process. Um, and, it kind of takes away the stigma uh, of having had a round like that um, in terms of seeking future financing. I had a That's good a question. One. Yeah, I had a good question on that, actually. This came up. We were just at the ACA Summit, which is the Angel Capital Association last week out in Vegas, which is mostly the world's organized angel groups. So big check writers for the most part, you know, 25K in advance. We did hear some chatter of some angels, you know, diversifying more with smaller checks and things like that, especially early angels. Um, but one question that comes up time and time again is you hear it from entrepreneurs, like I want a clean cap table, like VCs don't invest in like a, a dirty cap table with like a ton of names on it. Um, and there are some limitations. And this is a legitimate question for you, probably Pete, is if you have an SPV and say you roll up 500 small check investors into that, and it's one entry on your cap table, but the entity itself does have, you know, ownership interests, however it's designed. Does that flow up against the uh, private company um, shareholder limitations, which I believe is like 2000 or something like that? Or is the SPV just one seat? Um, I think as currently regulated, it's it's one seat. Um, there are securities regulations kind of a, a mangled mess at the moment, but <laughs> um, I 
I think for the time being, that kind of flies under the radar uh, for for that scrutiny. Yeah, you're Thank talking you. about like twelve G type stuff, Ryan. Like you have to be a public reporting company, even if you have an IPA, and you have to like generate all this stuff for the SEC. Yeah, I guess, actually, this will probably be good for our audience. We kind of jumped in the the deep end a little bit, but the all these terms like regulate when we say regulations or exemptions, Form D, five hundred six C, five hundred four, five hundred six B. Reg yeah. CF, Reg A, those are all something. So the SEC makes a requirement that if a company sells securities by default to anybody, you know, to raise money or whatnot, they have to register those securities with the SEC. Registering yeah. with the SEC is basically IPOing. It is incredibly expensive. It's time consuming. You have to get audited financials. You have to do, you basically have to do the representations necessary to make any random stranger in the world comfortable buying your stock with the full amount of disclosure that other random strangers would, like a public company. Yeah, startups can't do that. <laughs> they don't have the time, the money, the value. You know, there's no traction story usually really early on. Even if they have revenue, it's small. You know, so going through the onerous effort to do that is, you know, nothing that startups really do. But the SEC has made a bunch of exemptions, which is like you totally have to register those, those securities unless, you know, whatever yeah. line item this. For years and years, it was 506. Man, I always get them wrong. <laughs> 506C. Uh, which is you file form D to to basically make an exemption and saying, I'm only selling these securities to accredited investors. I didn't advertise it. I didn't wait, see that 506B. I didn't advertise it. I met them through my personal network. They know what they're getting into. They're, you know, they know the risks that they're taking and they are wealthy enough so that even if this all fails, because startups are super risky, you know, we're not stealing grandma's barn or, or house or anything like that. In the last five or six years, those new exemptions have been created to stipulate a lot of different means in which you can raise money while still not registering your securities, but doing the right kinds of disclosures, navigations, and regulation crowdfunding is one of those, and probably the most useful if you if uh, money from unaccredited investors is uh, something that you want to take in your funding round. So yeah. Did I mess up my five O's? Yeah, yeah. And I would agree with Pete on that too, Ryan. Like Pete, yeah, everything that I've seen too says yes, Reg CF preempts that if you use like Crowd SPB. Or if you use uh, what's called a trans custody and transfer agent. So if you think of like Apple on the stock market, they've got 2,300 investors. Well, wait, they have millions of people, right? No, they use custody and transfer agents to represent all those people. My understanding is Reg CF does that. Um, Reg A plus, my understanding is it does not. But since you've already done all the detailed like paperwork you have to do, you probably already have what you need to register the security. So. I think that's why they didn't preempt it there. At least that's my understanding, but it may have changed things too. All the better reason to get a lawyer when doing yes. any funding round, because even if you're going above the board and you're doing just accredited investors, there's still exemptions you want to file. And if you want to navigate the the SEC's, what is it, Edgar or something like that system yourself, have at it. <laughs> but I would much rather uh, a lawyer, you know, answer what those check boxes mean and what are the implications and what can I do and what can I say at what time uh, it's usually a, an asset to a funding round. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I know a, I know a founder who wrote his own reggae plus paperwork and not an attorney because he wanted to save money. I'm like, you crazy dude. It took him like <laughs> six months. Yeah. yeah, and even just time, like time is money too, where it's like, exactly. if you can pay for these services, you know. Get done. Yep, that's, uh, cool. that hurts my brain thinking about doing that. Uh, we got a bunch of great questions in the Q&A, but I wanted to give you an opportunity. Uh, somebody was asking what all those other tabs on the spreadsheet you were sharing with. It looked like some tips and strategies uh, to do other than just planning out your investment, which I would agree and advise, regardless of the round you're doing, coming up with lists and make them in the hundreds of people who might give yeah. you money and have an upside in your company is fantastic. I think we've even done events on how to do that. You can do it in a CRM. You can do it in a spreadsheet. Yeah. Um, you know, If you're on Gust and you're applying to Gust's groups and accelerators, we keep it all on your dashboard for you. But do this methodically and strategically because you cannot, you will likely not have a successful round if you're just going to like fire from the hip and be like, I'll just talk to a bunch of people and finally get that thing up on the website and people will click the give me money button. It's not going to go that way. No, definitely, definitely not going to go that way. And, you, you know, the other part extending on that, just because, and I shared that list with anybody that wants it, um, like investor market fit you know, pairing off why people, you may want to have people into your round. Again, like uh, we have seen $1,000 previously called dumb money because they don't meet a wealth status 
drive multi-million dollar revenue channels. One in particular was a uh, engineer at Walmart uh, thought one of the companies out there was cool named Gobi. And they, you know, Gobi had been doing about 1.4 million revenue. Well, that person who put a thousand dollars in unaccredited engineer at Walmart, uh, the founders reached out and to their whole investor base and said, hey, you know, we've been growing direct to consumer. Does anybody have a connection to big box retail? So that person raised their hand and said, like, well, I have a connection to the distributor, Sam's Club. Would that be helpful? They're like, yeah. <laughs> a $1.9 million order from a quote unquote dumb money check, just because of accreditation status and weren't accredited, but propelled the company forward. So who was the strategic investor in that case? <laughs> so like we've seen that regardless of industry multiple, multiple times. So one of the number one things that you're looking for after dollars in the bank from investment are dollars you don't have to pay back that also decrease your cost of sales, sales agents. So like, I won't go through all these. I mean, you can form partnerships and joint ventures through people that just invest and help do that. They like your company. They're like, oh, I could pair you with this other company. And you form a partnership or a joint venture, and now we'll grow through B2B channels, and which will also increase sales. So like, that's why it's super important to get your whole team. It's not just the CEO and founder of a company that does an investment crowdfunding around. They may be the ones doing a lot of the active talking with somebody, or if you're further along, maybe you have a CFO that's also helping with that. But really getting your whole team engaged to say, how can we mobilize the people we want to invest in the round? and turn them into these ambassadors is the most valuable thing that you can do. And if you want a little exercise that the, you know, the various people on the team can do, just, you know, you don't have to use this template, just pull in a little ch chart. If you have this many people invest and we're going after these revenue channels, what could it potentially generate for us as a company? Which will also, if you never launch a round, will also help you grow sales as a company because you'll be thinking about it in a sales mindset. So second tactic, I'll share that too. Yeah, that's a that's a fascinating example because I, I would say again for any fundraising thing, it's like investor updates can propel your business forward regardless of you know where that investor base is. The most common things, a lot of startups founders, they you know they they can't stand the idea of writing a monthly report to their investors or even a quarterly report. You talk to any investors, they're like, I might get a yearly report from most of my portfolio companies. You know, they take the money and then they heads down and quiet and you know no news is good news and whatever. Angels can be assets, but the crowd can be assets too. And the more you keep your investors up to date and ask them for stuff, almost end every email with like, this is what we're looking for. We're hired, we're trying to hire somebody. You know, we're trying to get into, you know, a big partner company. We're trying to find a good law firm. You're fine here. But you know, any of those things, you can get a huge amount of upside. And I didn't actually think about it in terms of the the people who do this professionally, angel investors and you know, high net worth individuals are often very busy. You know, the classic yeah. thing, I made a joke earlier, like the VC, how can I help? You know, I'm declining you. I'm not going to give you your money, but I'm going to say, how can I help? And they're useless, right? They're not actually going to do anything. They just, you know, they, they like to play the good guy. You know, they're going to run off to their other partner meetings and things like that. But people who are getting into the space, you know, people that like they work at tech companies, you know, they make six figures, you know, they make, I mean, some of them make three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 a year. They're technically accredited investors. But they don't have the time. If they're still working at Google, they're not going to go to the ACA Summit or join an angel group or you know go become a VC on the side or anything like that. They might only their deal source might have to be crowdfunding rounds in their personal network. But you know, one of the number one effective sales strategies that emerged over the the SaaS uh, era, the, especially the B two B SaaS, is sell to the employees, the engineers, get them using your stuff for free, and then later on when it's you know invaluable to the company, you know somebody's going to approve the the enterprise, you know, tier level. People who are not traditionally doing this, so employees, tech workers and things like that, them I'm not even going to say, I'm going to use the term like playing in business, but playing in investment and actually doing stuff is probably a lot more appealing to them because they don't do hundreds of deals a year. They're not constantly connecting people, you know, from an investment from a corporate standpoint. So they might actually have, you know, a higher incentive, you know, especially if they have skin in the game with your own company. But also it's like, this is, you know, part-time for them, but also very possibly meaningful and valuable to connect to people, to connect to businesses or whatnot uh, through a channel that an angel investor probably wouldn't even think of um, because they're, you know, looking at, oh, I have pitch competitions and I have, you know, terms and I have to deploy this much capital over this many years to this many companies and my portfolio strategy. But this is a whole different layer of kind of building your network 
um, and revenue opportunities. Yeah, super, super well said. 110% agree. Pete, do you have anything to add to that? Nothing to add. We can uh, uh, train rolling. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's keep moving on. I'm going to give a couple of different examples. Again, try to ignore industry that I'm going to show you and focus more on the process that we're showing because, again, investment crowdfunding is a process, just like we've been describing a gun after capital and momentum for growing your company. And guess what? Every successful company that's ever exited, they formed really good process around driving traction. So the traction for growing your company, sitting around process, is very similar to the traction that's sitting around successful investment crowdfunding raises. So example one that I'll share, uh, people asked about parallel offerings. Uh, this was a fun one. So you'll notice it looks like the company only raised $97,700. I guess what they had a parallel offering where they did a revenue share to their audience of people that wanted to build an indoor golf facility coming off of, you know, one that was outdoors. They they just wanted their community to participate and feel like, you know, make them part of the journey. So they did it on a revenue share. And then parallel, they had 500 k come in from a single check writer that was strategic to the growth of the company. It also happens like golf and near the founders. Like, you can do both of those in parallel, and guess what? Everything was disclosed properly because they went through proper legal counsel. I've seen a lot of people do this wrong and not disclose it. That's a bad no-no. <laughs> Get sued for that type of stuff. So, like, if you're doing a parallel offering, um, well, you have to engage legal either way. But if you're doing a parallel offering, even more reason to engage legal because the platforms that are out there, regardless of platform, they're not – they're not your legal counsel. They're not required to check for all that. But, you know, the important part to the company here, being able to raise $597,000, was they got the capital they needed. They also got the sales agents, brand ambassadors they needed. And it came from all friendly sources, the big check and the small checks. How cool is that for a company to launch their new operation with a, a crowd they already had coming off of that? Um, another one we mentioned earlier was a company that oversubscribed around. They did a concurrent offering, meaning they had this accredited only, but you can publicly solicit it, you know, called Reg D 506 C. And they paralleled that and got all their accredited investors to find out that, you know, this is how you should pitch it. And then in parallel, they went to the, the Reg CF, the crowd investors after that. And basically, you can't see it now because the offering's closed, but they had a disclosure up front and center on the page. They said, hey, look, if you're investing 25K or more, um, we're going to channel you into this other offering that's running in parallel. So again, properly disclosed out there, properly disclosed behind the scene, but it took the legal counsel to help do that and make sure that it was properly crafted. Uh, one other thing too, and I can't quite see how to, just have to do this. Do you need to do anything? Oh, wait, no, I could just do this. I'm sorry. Sometimes it's simple things in life, guys. <laughs> um, Josh Terry Bitball, uh, you know, again, there are a million people with a million followers on social. There are even more people that have 10,000 to 100,000, several hundred thousand followers on social that talk about everything. Aside from Bitcoin, they talk about STEM, uh, you know, engineering. They talk about space. They talk about, you name it, basically every single topic that you want to find is on TikTok. YouTube, Instagram, et cetera. Guess what? Those people that create that content are phenomenal at marketing. We've never had a time as founders in human history where we had the power of social media and people that can create really good content and to partner them with operators. That's exactly what happened in this offering was that these you know, this team and the rest of the team said, you know what, we see Bitcoin, we think there's a decentralized currency that's coming. Every fiat currency in the history of humankind has always lost value. So their belief is, we don't know whether it's going to be Bitcoin or something else, but how crazy it is that we've got all these ICOs and everything else, but people that want to just invest in Bitcoin, the only path they have is to invest in Bitcoin. What if they could actually become part of a team and learn the operations side of it? So Josh Terry had been talking about this for a while. 
He talks about that and life and some other things on the social media channel. He has influence around those. And he said, hey, guys, my you know, network, I want to launch a Bitcoin mining operation with the ability for anybody to invest in Bitcoin miner for lower than the price of a you know, Bitcoin miner, basically. So I want you to be able to invest in an operation for lower than the cost of Bitcoin mining operation. Not Bitcoin itself, but like the wind farm, the servers, everything else. Would anybody like to come along for the journey? 47 second TikTok video, $2.1 million of interest in two weeks in a simple web form. And then when people have to actually translate it where they have to put real dollars in, like connect a bank account, throw in their social security number, invest in an entity with you know, the EIN, you see the result of that. I know this is a Bitcoin mining example. I have seen this done time and time and time again, but it has to be done properly. It's not like you're you know, going out there and raising and you're just trying to get investment dollars in. No, like this team is engaged with each other daily. They all live together. You know, it is a startup company. It's not we use an influencer to get investment dollars. Big, big difference there. Um, but the cool part is they still have no website, but they're cash flowing. So you can build brand new companies from the crowd if you have the right influencer channels that are already authentically talking about a topic that want to partner together as like head of marketing with the people that are going to provide core operations and they take on the same roles that you take on in any company. It's just an accelerated way of building a brand new company. So I'm going to pause there and see what questions that stirs up. Yeah, we have a ton of questions in the Q&A. Uh, I don't know if you want to just start jumping into those. We only have seven minutes left unless you guys want to hang out a little bit and answer more questions, or if you wanted to cover any more of the strategies that um, you went through before we jump into that. Uh, yeah, sure. We can dive into more questions. Let's see. I'm running through the list right here. Any pop out, uh, Pete or Ryan, that we haven't answered today? Uh, let me see. Uh, does, is this uh, relevant for Canadian companies? Real quick one. Uh, yes, they operate under different regulations, but the most common uh, things we're seeing today are Canadian companies trying to set up shop in the U.S. So if they set up shop in the U.S., they can raise underneath regulation crowdfunding in the U.S. Um, there's various details on how you have to do that, so definitely engage legal counsel for it. <laughs> but it, it can be done, and it is being done, and has been done. Yeah, with our with our offering, the Delaware flip, which is very common for not just Canadian, but international companies as well. Often if a company has some traction internationally, but they want to get at U.S. investors and U.S. fundraising laws, you can set up a Delaware C corporation. You will want to work with counsel to then figure out what relationship does that C corporation have with the already existing entity, whether it's contractual, whether it's ownership. You want to be sure you obey the laws of both countries and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but you can you can start Delaware C Court from anywhere. They will take your franchise tax yearly. They would love to have it. Um, <laughs> reach out to me if you, a new Delaware C Corp is in your future. Uh, we do that. That's our specialty. And we have great law firms like Fourscore that can help you with the follow-on stuff. Um, Al did clarify his question about the two-year audit. Uh, does going through the, the exercise to actually raise the cap provide a better appearance to investors? Is it worth it? Uh if for appearance to investors, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, like, just go out there and see who's going to fund your company. You know, up to like a million. I think it's like one point two three five million you can raise now under reviewed financials. And if you get more interest in that, great. You just like, you know, spend a little bit of time to do the audit and taking the rest, or you shut down the raise, do audit later, taking the rest. I mean, every single offering we've ever seen has more interest after an offering after it closes. So you can just relaunch with those. You know, that's a pathway. Relaunch with the new ones or just do the audit in the middle of the campaign if you can get done and just extend the cap. Yeah, I would say probably don't do the audit preemptively if you don't right. already have the interest coming in and you're you're rolling up the traction and things like that. Yeah, agreed. Um, you touched on a little bit of this um, in terms of like the market differentiations, but uh, does doing a regulation crowdfunding round change the reactions you get from VCs and angel investors? For the better, for worse. It depends on who the angel or VC is. I don't know, Pete, have you seen any? What would you say about that? You probably see a lot more of that than me. Yeah. Um, I, I touched on the point earlier, but I, I do think the stigma has kind of gone away 
um, with the introduction of the SPV vehicle. Um, so they're not scared away <laughs> generally at first blush like they used to be. Um, and there is kind of more appetite for the business case uh, for having crowd investors behind you and, and boots on the ground in terms of actually pushing uh, what you're putting on the market. Yeah. And, you know, extend on that too, Pete, like the two types of conversations I've normally seen come up with angels and VCs that are participating for the first time in a reg CF offering or like their company's doing it. There's a camp of like angels, VCs have never seen it. Like you're saying, Pete, and they just have questions about it because it's like, it's brand new. Like even though it's seven years old, it's brand new. They're concerned about it. But if they unpack all that, they're like, oh, that makes sense. We get how it impacts us, really doesn't impact us. It's good, it's friendly to the company, everybody's not voting, like, awesome, let's go. If you have the other camp of VCs and angels, they're like, well, you know, that just impacts my ego. <laughs> you might wanna run away anyway, <laughs> but that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, and often in this environment, it's a, uh, you know, kind of like the water in the desert question where if the conversation with angels is never going to happen, unless you actually raise some money from the crowd to demonstrate some traction, like you're imagining a, a black mark that might, you know, never come to fruition because you've gave, given up anyway. And yeah. like Pete said earlier, is like, you can clean things up. It does become more expensive, you know, the, the more you have to clean up. But like, I've seen this from vesting schedules to safe fundraising instruments and whatnot. If people want to get a deal done, you can clean things up later. So, you know, if you want to, you know, pursue something and it's really your only opportunity, you know, imagining concerns of people you have not yet met um, can sometimes be uh, an exhausting exercise. Um, we talked about some cool strategies to be proactive and to make sure that's successful. What about the opposite? Red flags to avoid. You know, you've decided that you want to do a campaign. Is there a top five list of things to just be sure you do not do? Uh. Well, we already talked about making sure you have legal counsel. <laughs> Make sure your team's like, don't go forward unless your team's lined around it. Uh, if you get negative feedback when you're doing one-on-ones, like develop lists and go talk to people and you can't get consistency, like around at least three top things people want, there may be something broken within the company you need to fix. Or maybe you're ever explaining, maybe you're gonna have a hard time in your sales process. Uh, trying to put it out there. I think you touched on this too. Like don't go shop from the rooftop. We're doing a reg CF raise. Yep. You know, even if you have the simple testing disclosures to test that, if you're not sure you're going to pursue it, like make sure you engage with counsel first and know the ramifications of doing that too early. Uh, I don't know, Pete, what would be a fifth one? Uh, I mean, you, you kind of touched on the, the biggest ones, but um, definitely as you go, just being wary and mindful of the, the advertising limitations. Um, so you you can say almost everything, um, but there are uh, what are called tombstone limitations to where if you mention certain no-nos, like the price of the security, how much is being raised, when the deadline is, um, then you can only say those things. And it, it has to be kind of sanitized and stripped of any selling points. Um, so I, I think that's the the other biggest thing is just to make sure you're not uh, intentionally or inadvertently <laughs> running afoul of any of those regulatory rules. Yeah, I think I have two more. Uh, one, just double down a little bit on that, uh, because I think I say this almost at every, <laughs> every uh, event we do now is that these things don't automatically happen, the the bad things. Like they're not self-enforcing. The SEC is not going to knock on your door the next day after you tweet about your crowdfunding around and be like, hey. That was, you know, you didn't have an exemption for that or anything like that. Um, the sad thing is most people don't realize these things until like a good thing happens, like a round is decided to be done and then the cleanup starts and it's like, oh, wait a second. There are people committing securities fraud on Twitter all the time. Uh, Anybody that you hear, you know, just shouting from the rooftops, like I'm raising for this, my company's super successful, I want you on my cap table and whatnot they generally don't get prosecuted if things don't actually succeed. You know, if they can't through all their blustering and whatnot on, on social media, like if there's never a company and if the funds never happen and nobody ever sues and it never goes through those processes, you won't hear, you know, it's not like the SEC will retweet their tweet and be like, this was securities fraud, please come down to our office. Yeah. So, getting a bit of the roadmap and awareness before you jump into any of these things is um, not doing that would be a red flag. The biggest tiny other red flag, I think, is just... Uh, 
not doing it strategically and raising money on your way to a crowdfunding round. I've seen this, you know, I've seen a lot of people be like, oh, we're trying to do a crowdfunding round. Oh, it's more work than we thought. We might have to take some money from like, you know, rich people that I know that are accredited investors in between. There's some sensitivities there. There's like a waiting period. You're going to push like things by 30 days and like just having the wherewithal, working with a good platform and a good lawyer so that you don't just make you know, technical errors where it's like, oh, you couldn't shoot, you know, you're ready to go with your marketing campaign. You're going to spend money on Facebook. You're going to write all those emails out to all your friends and followers only to find out like, no, you got to cool your jets for 30 days because you took 25 grand from accredited Uncle Bill last week to make it to this week. And that can really just, you know, play a kind of a shell game with the things. All right. Do you guys have a little extra time or can we call it and maybe just do another one of these in the future? Because obviously there's a lot of questions out there, it looks like. Yeah, I mean, if we want to do one in the future, this like, I don't know, quick fire on answering questions, maybe we could do that. Yeah, actually, that would be great. I'll make sure everybody who RSVP to this um, will get that. That'll be a fun follow up. Um, but unfortunately, I think we're going to have to wrap it uh, for here. But any uh, any last words or advice from either of you? Pete? Yeah, sorry, uh, I shouldn't say either of you. <laughs> Pete, you go yeah. first. <laughs> sure, sure thing. I want to thank everybody for hopping on. Uh, hopefully we uh, added some value and you learned something. Um, you can feel free to, literally free to follow up uh, with me. I'm going to send a link now uh, and it'll go away once we hang up here. But it's, uh, <laughs> I'll get it. Uh, I always send out like a follow-up email uh, with like a link to the recording and anything we mentioned that's relevant. So just send me that link and I'll be sure that people get it if they couldn't stay the whole time or if the ephemeral nature of the uh, Zoom chat goes away. <laughs> right. Um, but this is just to to get on my calendar for a consultation. Um, usually make some time to to chat through things free of charge, um, just to help you get your head on straight and, and kind of know what you need. Um, but yeah, very happy to share with you all. And thank you for your time. Now, how about you, Will? Yeah, and I, I thank everybody, too, for being here today. I mean, I hope we've demystified, like Pete was saying, we've demystified the process going about it. You know, it's not something you can build in, people come, and that you got a few tips and tricks from us that, you know, you could actually apply if you wanted to go through one of these. But definitely seek out counsel when you're going through that and, uh, you know, explore it. Like, find out what it can do for your company before you pull the trigger on something, because... Who knows, maybe you're missing your largest sales channel out there just because you never ran around. And so that that's what I think is, you know, the attractive force for a lot of founders who really focus on growth and trying to get to some type of exit, whether that's pass down to family or IPO or sell to somebody else, is what the crowd can actually do to make meaningful progress there. That's what I get most excited about. So if you guys want to get in touch with me, here's my email. There's again my social links. Uh, uh, I've got a calendar, but it's like, way in the future so i'll just give my email <laughs> I, do the same thing. Thing too. <laughs> I have the calendar like three four or five weeks away it doesn't even start our kids are out of school now we're traveling and we got our yeah yeah uh, awesome well thank you so much will and pete um like i said we have more questions than we can answer but we will try to find uh follow up and maybe just live q a um or something like that we'll figure it out and fourth score has been great partners with us uh doing all this program so look out for more from us and Will, I'm going to reach out to you about Encolo because that's a cool, um, that's a cool service, you know, different than just the platforms. Like we're pretty friendly with a lot of the platforms, like WeFunder and whatnot. We even yeah. have like deals for our customers, you know, to reduce the percentage of raise, but there might be some nice, yep. uh, I'm not going to say synergy. I'm going to say collaborative opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you again for exactly. your time. Have a great week, everybody. And yes, we'll send out the recording and the links and all the things like that in the next coming days. Um, thank you very much. And thank you for attending in those great questions. Have a good one, everybody.